from Europe who uh, joined the seminar. I know it's really late for you, so I really appreciate it. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about some work that I've been um, doing recently, but which also connects to all the work I did during my PhD in Cambridge. Um, and I, I recently, um, you know, started working again on, um, so which would be focused on um, solar flares and what uh, we can learn from uh, Iris diagnostics. Um, so I'm going to start by showing a nice movie of flare. I think you're all uh, familiar with flares, but it's always nice to see a nice movie of a big flare, I think. Um, so this was a very uh, large event that was observed in 2017 and studied by many people. Uh, so these are images from the Ghost uh, uh instrument showing plasma at uh, tens of millions of degrees. Um, so as you can see, flares are very uh, energetic uh, phenomena and um, they are associated with release of radiation in different wavelengths, acceleration of uh, energetic particles and uh, ejection of hot uh, material um, towards the outer atmosphere and have um, significant impact on the on space weather. Um, so in, even though um, there's been a lot of progress in understanding flares in, uh, um, in the last years, there are still many things that we, we don't understand and many of the details in the energy release and transport that are not uh, clear. So this is another oh, sorry this is another movie of a uh, zoom in of the same flare. Um, so you're in the background. I'm showing a composite movie of three AI filters uh, showing plasma at very high uh, temperatures, um, around 10, 20 million degrees, but also cooler, uh, cooler temperatures. Um, also, you can see the uh, slit, this uh, scanning um, slits from uh, eyes and iris, um, showing the field of view of these uh, two UV spectrometers. Um, so part of most of my uh, work has been focused on trying to combine multi-wavelength uh, imaging and UV uh, spectroscopic observations of flares. Um, this can be challenging because um, of the limited um, special coverage of the spectrometers and uh, of course the issues with co-alignment dif between different instruments. Uh, but when we combine spectros spectroscopy and um, imaging, we can obtain a lot of uh, important um, plasma diagnostics and parameters which allow us to uh, probe the physical condition of the plasma during flares, uh, such as flows, uh, temperature, densities, um, uh, chemical abundances, etc. Um, and these uh, diagnostics uh, can, can provide important constraints for the flare models. Uh, so this is just a very um, schematic um, representation of the uh, st uh, standard flare model. So that's our um, sort of current understanding of, of flares can be uh, summarized by this uh, so-called standard flare model. Uh, of course, this is a very simplified 2D cartoon. The reality is much more complex, but uh, the main idea is that there is a connection happening in the corona um, and uh, the energy release um, due to the connection uh, hits the plasma locally, accelerate uh, particles and um, initiate uh, waves and in all cases the energy is uh, transported from the reconnection site down to uh, the so-called foot points of the flare loops um, and uh, there the chromospheric and transition region plasma is heated to very high temperatures in a very short time um, and the plasma is not able to radiate away all the energy and because of the overpressure there will be um, uh, the, the plasma will um, um, uh, start flowing upward and fill the flare loops in the what is so-called chromospheric evaporation even though it's more of a ablation and uh, of uh, hot plasma uh, so then the plasma will then fill the flare loops and we see the flare loops uh, very bright in high temperature lines like uh, i showed before in the in the movies that we just watched um, so the chromospheric evaporation is has been observed uh, typically as blue shifts uh, in uh, uv and soft x-ray lines which are formed uh, the high temperatures above 10 million degrees. Um, and then for momentum conservation, we also see uh, what is called the chromospheric condensation. So um, we will see a downflow of cooler uh, materials. So that is observed as redshifts in cooler chromospheric and transition region lines. So this is the main uh, the main idea, but the main scenario, but then there are lots of uh, questions that still remain unsolved, in particular, how the energy is produced and stored and transported, uh, et cetera. Uh, so one of the approaches that people have, have used to 
um, try to understand more about uh, flare models is to compare the response of the heating uh, of the oh, sorry the response of the plasma to the heating with predictions from models. Um, in particular, uh, 1D models um, are very useful for this. Um, so here I'm just putting a list of some of some of commonly used 1D models in flares, but I'm sure there are many others. Um, and uh, basically, the advantage of uh, 1D um, field-aligned hydrodynamic models is that they allow us to um, simulate a lot of the relevant physics and uh, to very good spatial resolution with uh, relatively um, uh, small uh, computational effort. Um, and different codes can focus on different aspects and different diagnostics, uh, like non-equilibrium ionization rather than uh, non-local thermal equilibrium, etc. Uh, so most of my work, I'd say, has been focusing on trying to, to do this comparison between plasma diagnostics and um, simulations from hydrodynamic models. Um, so these are the, with this sort of introduction, these are the topics I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about evaporation and condensation diagnostics from iris, in particular what we have learned from iris. So this is a bit uh, older work that I've been doing, mostly doing my PhD. And uh, then I'm also going to talk about more recent work on trying to understand what we can learn from um, iris on also um, on he different he uh, heating mechanisms using uh, broadening of non-thermal um, non -thermal broadening of lines. Um, so this is just a very brief uh, history for people who are not uh, familiar with this topic too much. Uh, so as I said before, uh, evaporation is, um, is a key um, prediction of the standard flare model and it has been observed since the early uh, 80s uh, in, with, um, in the spectra of um, uh, early ionized atoms such as uh, carbon-19 or iron-25, etc. Uh, so the first observations were um, of lines, which were mostly these very hot lines that are observed uh, only during flares, uh, were still mostly at rest and they showed the blue wing uh, asymmetry, uh, which people interpreted as due to the evaporation. Uh, however, the, pro the models would predict that the lines are completely blue shifted during the evaporation, so this was still a, a bit of uncertainty about that. Uh, another um, uh, early finding was that the lines were very broad during during the flare uh, during flares for several minutes with non-thermal velocities exceeding 100 kilometers per second. Um, another interesting paper is a paper of this uh, earlier um, observations uh, I think is one from um, Mariska in 94 where they looked at uh, large statistics of around 200 flares in different locations along the solar disk. And while they did find some correlation between uh, the Doppler shifts and the location with the sun um, from the sun center, there was an obvious correlation between the broadening and distance from the sun center from this early study. Uh, however, it should be uh, pointed out that these were early observations where uh, the resolution was limited and there was um, often people were observing superposition of different um, plays in the flare foot points and loops. Uh, with uh, the advent of uh, more uh, special resolved uh, spectroscopy with uh, several instruments and more uh, recently CDS and ICE, uh, our understanding has uh, greatly improved. Um, still, uh, most of the observations showed um, uh, something that was similar to, um, to this, like from this uh, paper of George Doshek or uh, Peter Young, where they were observing um, the spectra of very high uh, temperature lines, like around 24, around 23. Uh, which were uh, mostly uh, at rest, but then there was a prominent blue wing emission. And in some cases, it was even very well separated, like in this uh, case of Peter Young. Um, in some uh, few cases, they could see that the line was completely blue shifted in agreement with the models, but this was not uh, routinely observed, I'd say. Um, so, and still even uh, with the improved resolution of the spectrometer, still very large uh, line broadening was observed during all the impulsive phase of the flares. <laughs> uh, also, there is a recent uh, paper of Mandaj and Russia looking at uh, trying to simulate these asymmetries with ice line, which I, it's really interesting. Um, another um, 
uh, well, another important um, finding of these um, observations from CDS and NICE is the fact that uh, uh, we could observe um, uh, the Doppler shifts uh, the, uh, during uh, the impulsive phase of flirts in a, over a broad uh, range of temperatures. Uh, and uh, people could observe both the condensation and evaporation, and um, in particular, I said a lot, uh, as a lot of, uh, of lines are formed over a broad range of temperatures, so you could really see that uh, when there is the shift from evaporation to condensation, um, it's a function of temperature. Um, uh, there's, been, there's been a lot of uh, modeling effort as well to reproduce this, these trends. Um, and one thing that we have learned is that this threshold, this temperature threshold where we see the evaporation and condensation is not fixed, uh, it depends on a lot of things, uh, in particular it changes from micro flares to large flares. And it's actually a very uh, important constraint because basically um, it's determined by the layer, the depth uh, at which the electrons are stopped and deposited their eating, uh, which will determine the temperature which we see the shift between condensation and um, evaporation, so it provides uh, important constraints for the models. Uh, so with the uh, advent of uh, IRIS, our understanding has um, greatly improved uh, uh, of uh, chromospheric evaporation. So um, IRIS is a, um, a simultaneous imager and a, a spectrograph. Uh, that means that we have con uh, context uh, images and um, with the spectra, which we don't have with uh, with eyes, for example, this uh, is really important to understand where uh, actually we are observing. Uh, and um, Iris has uh, four filters, an imager with the four filters observing mostly plasma in the chromosphere and transition region at very high resolution. And the spectrograph, which has, um, also observes uh, lines from photosphere to chromosphere transition region. Uh, and also one, only one flare line, Darren 21, which is formed around 10 million degrees. Um, and the resolution is very high, it's around 10 times better than ICE and CDS. Um, so uh, this is just a movie to show, uh, uh, illustrate some of the capabilities of IRIS. Uh, so this is a movie of the, of, uh, the 10th of September 2014 flare, which was uh, studied by many uh, many authors. Uh, it was a very nice observation with the uh, iris. So in the background we see um, uh, a ZOAA movie and uh, of the flare and then on the top there is the field of view of the iris as Lijo imager um, showing the flare ribbons over time. Uh, the, the vertical black line is the spectral curve slit of iris. Uh, in this case it was a sit and star observation that means the slit was fixed over time and it crossed, crossed one of the flare ribbons and we have very good observations. Uh, this is another movie from this flare uh, showing also the spectroscopic capabilities of iris. So on the, on the right we have the Sligio imager in the 1400 channel which is dominated by silicon-4 emission, which is a transition region line. And uh, um, in the middle panel is the CCD, the spectrograph CCD of iris in this uh, spectral window, which includes uh, iron-21. Uh, on the left panel, it's a movie of uh, just the, the, the spectra of, um, uh, in the spectral window where there is iron-21 at one slit position over time, indicated by this uh, pink line. Um, so we can see there are many um, narrow photospheric lines, which are uh, lines which are mostly visible during the um, during the impulsive phase of of the flare at the ribbons, uh, and also this broad emission is there in 21 that we can see either uh, in the CCD or in the in the spectra. Uh, so this is the broad is broad because of course it's a high temperature lines uh, in contrast to the photospheric lines which are narrow. Uh, so thanks to these um, observations, we have uh, learned a lot uh, about chromospheric evaporation. Uh, so one of the insights, new insights from Maris, uh, is that the lines are observed to be completely blue shifted in agreement with the models. Um, so uh, in, and in contrast to uh, ICE that was not always observing this. Uh, so the lines are observed to be completely blue shifted and broadened and also mostly symmetric and it could be fitted with a single Gaussian. Uh, the Doppler shift and the broadening were also are also observed to be highly correlated over time. So this is uh, uh, an image from um, um, our paper where we uh, see the Doppler shift and uh, non-thermal broadening and they um, gradually decrease over time going uh, towards the peak of the flare and they are highly correlated indicating that the process which is broadening the line and causing the evaporation are um, correlated to. 
Um, so in order to understand if um, basically the main difference between iris and ice uh, was the due to the special resolution, uh, we also observed the flare where both spectrometers were observing uh, the same flare ribbon over time. Uh, this is actually um, not uh, easy. There are not many flares where we have uh, managed to, to observe uh, with both spectrometers because um, of course of the uh, limited spatial coverage of the instruments, but also um, pointing uncertainty, et cetera. In this case, we could mess, uh, observe one of the ribbons um, at the same time with both um, with both spectrometers and uh, what we observe is that Iris uh, systematically observes uh, symmetric and fully blue shifted iron 21 lines while Iris observe um, more um, asymmetric um, uh, line profiles. So they observe different lines. So Iris observe iron 21 and Ice iron 23, but they're very close in temperatures. Uh, but so this kind uh, seems to support the idea that uh, Iris is finally resolving the mission from the flare foot point from the loop emission. Uh, another important um, paper from this early um, Iris papers on Iron 21 was the um, uh, paper of Dave Graham and Jenna Kautzi, where they observed uh, for the 2014 X class flare that I showed before, uh, they observed uh, the behavior of many tens of individual foot points. Um, that crosses cross the slit and they basically saw that there was a very consistent uh, behavior of trend of evaporation as a function of time. So uh, here they're plotting the, um, uh, the, the trend of uh, Doppler shifts in RN21 as a function of time. So the, all the, the ribbon, tens of ribbon pixels seem to behave very consistently and there is a very smooth uh, gradual uh, uh, decrease of evaporation over time over um, I think a few a few minutes. There is also a more recent uh, paper where they uh, uh, investigate the, um, um, the, the cooler lines, the more the condensation part. So these are some uh, examples of um, of this iron 21 spectra from their paper. Uh, so you can see that it's the, this line, which is indicated in green, it's very broad and very, um, very symmetric that can be see fitted with a Gaussian. Um, so Iris also observes uh, the condensation uh, part. Uh, so the cooler, cooler lines, such as uh, chromospheric um, lines and transition region lines, such, such as silicon pore. Um, so while we see this gradual decrease of, um, of uh, blue shifts over time, we also see um, for, conversely um, red shifts in, uh, in the cooler lines. So uh, iris uh, really allow us to observe um, to observe both both things with a very high resolution and uh, cadence. Uh, so why is it important to um, to study these trends and this observation over time? Uh, over time. Um, uh, the reason is uh, because um, these um, observations can provide, as I mentioned before, can provide strict constraints on the models and uh, we can learn things about about the heating, um, the, the details of the heating. Uh, so for example, uh, Jeffrey Ree, Perry Warren, they have a um, series of paper where they try to explain the sort of persistent redshifts that are observed in silicon four during flares. Um, and they see that they can't can't uh, reproduce it using any single loop model, but we need multi-thread loop models. And also to try to reproduce the sort of smooth um, trend of evaporation over time that um, we, we observe in the evaporation and condensation also, we need, uh, we need many loops and there are constraints that you can obtain on the duration of the single, of the, of the heating in single loops. So in the paper, they found um, uh, heating durations of a few tenths of second can reproduce this, uh, these observations, but um, clearly there is um, still a lot to be learned from this, um, from this uh, observations. Uh, so this was a little bit of a longer introduction on new new insights from uh, from Iris in the chromospheric evaporation condensation, um, and then I'm now I'm gonna talk a bit more about um, what we can learn about the broadening of and other spectral characteristics of this uh, line. Um, so as I mentioned before, the line is uh, observed the uh, interior line is observed to be very uh, broad and symmetric, so that means that it seems to be fitted well with a single Gaussian profile in contrast to previous observation with ice. 
Um, so what we wanted to do uh, was to uh, try to understand um, if this can provide uh, more information about um, um, different heating mechanisms, in particular, if we can reproduce these uh, spectral characteristics with the, with the models that we have at the moment. Um, so we took as example, uh, again, this uh, 2014 X-class flare, which was um, a sort of textbook observations from Iris of a flare. And um, we tried to, first of all, quantify a bit more what we mean when we are saying that the line seems to be symmetric. Uh, so here on the left, I'm showing again um, an image, a slito image of the flare um, uh, with the Iris lit is uh, indicated by this uh, vertical line. Uh, and then we, we here I'm showing just two example profiles uh, of the Iron 21 spectral window. Uh, these are, I'd say, very typical profiles during at the ribbon during the um, evaporation. So we see a lot of photospheric lines, um, and uh, we have blended all the lines. So we subtracted all these lines and the continuum. And what you you uh, have in the end is um sort of clean uh, Iron 21 deblended profile. Um, so, uh, as you can see, this seems to be um, quite symmetric and be fixed, um, fitted with the, with the Gaussian uh, profile. Um, and we also defined, tried to define the symmetry of this line by uh, using our, our um, red-blue asymmetry uh, parameter that was introduced, uh, used in previous papers in different contexts, actually for a more coronalytic studies, but the main idea is that uh, it's just very simply the difference between the intensity in the red and the blue wing of the line uh, normalized by the line peak. Um, so we see that um, uh, the red blue symmetry is very small in this uh, example profiles that we we are looking at. Um, there is a large er error. Uh, this is because this line is very faint at the very beginning of the flare. And uh, of course, there would be a uh, significant uncertainty in the wings that we uh, we take into account. Uh, but even then, um, the, the symmetry seems to be quite small, uh, below 10%, I'd say. Um, and we also uh, measure the broadening of the line with the, using the standard deviation. So uh, that would be the sigma for a Gaussian, just to have an idea of, of the broadening. And, uh, uh, and it's very large at the beginning. So uh, then we try to understand uh, to understand a bit more of possible processes that are causing this broadening. So um, these are some just schematics of some of the uh, scenarios that have been suggested to explain um, non-thermal light broadening in flares. Uh, so the most uh, popular um, interpretation is that we're just uh, seeing a superposition of unresolved flows along the line of sight where the flows are um, directed in, um, in the direction uh, parallel to the magnetic field. Um, other processes such as uh, alpha and waves can, can um, contribute to the broadening and they're directed uh, mostly in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. Or there are processes that do not have a preferential direction uh, with the magnetic field, uh, such as um, turbulence or um, very large uh, ion temperature. So if the, what I mean is if the temperature of the ion is much larger than what we assume based on the electron temperature, of course, that would cause a sort of uh, um, symmetric broadening. Um, so in this um, first uh, work, we have uh, tried to focus on the first scenario, the superposition of flow, and see if uh, just by using simple models uh, superposing flows, we can obtain um, the, the simulation, uh, sorry, the observations that we see with Iris. Uh, so we use uh, Radin 1D simulations. So Radin, uh, I've mentioned it before, uh, it's uh, similarly to IDRED, um, a field aligned uh, hydrodynamic model that solves the equations of radiation hydrodynamics on um, a 1D adaptive grid. Um, so we can assume different uh, heating functions. Uh, so here we're assuming that uh, the loop, uh, the loops are heated by a beam of accelerated electrons uh, with power law distribution. Uh, so we assume this, um, this um, parameters for the electron distributions, which are uh, or quite typical for large class flares. Uh, we are not in particular uh, trying to um, simulate a specific event, but a gener generic large flare. So these are typical parameters that are uh, often find, uh, found with REST-C2. Um, we also used uh, 
uh, the, the loop length uh, we assume is taken from the measurement that we take from AA uh, for this 2014 um, X-class flare uh, that I have mentioned before, and the duration of the heating uh, is also taken from a uh, paper from G Jeffrey Ripetal. Uh, however, we did try uh, to assume different uh, input parameters, and we did a small exploration of uh, space, um, of parameter space. Uh, assuming different fluxes for the energy um, energy flux of the electrons, uh, hitting um, shorter heating mechanisms, so shorter loops, but uh, I didn't uh, change uh, substantially the the results that we found. So I'm just showing these uh, examples for this parameter space. Um, so we synthesized the R21 line in a single loop uh, simulation using uh, Chianti. Uh, and then we create a multi-strand uh, loop bundle um, to um, analyze, and uh, we assume different models, different geometries to try to uh, simulate the superposition of flow scenario. Uh, so these different models are um, summarized by these by these cartoons. Um, so the first simple, simplest idea is that Iris is looking straight through the flat loops, uh, so straight at the foot points, so the loops have no inclination from the vertical. Um, then uh, the, a bit more realistic assumption, of course, is that the, the loops would have um, an inclination from the vertical of a certain uh, angle uh, theta. Um, then a bit uh, more realistic assumption, uh, is also that the loops are all rooted in different locations along the flat ribbons. Uh, that means that Iris will look through different sections of different loops at different times. And also the way these um, loops are activated over time can be different. Uh, so we, we do some experiments on that, uh, trying to activate the loops at uh, random times or progressively over times in a sort of slipping reconnection scenario. Uh, and also we assume that the loop bundle um, as, a, as a last model, we assume that there is um, expanding cross section with height of the of the loop uh, bundle. So I'm just going to show some of uh, the results for different um, for some of these models. Uh, so this is um, synthetic R21 emission on the left. Um, so as a function of uh, velocity and over time for the single loop uh, strand. Um, so we see that the line is first completely blue shifted, and then it goes um, it goes uh, to rest as uh, expected during the, the evaporation. Uh, in the middle panel, we I'm, sure I'm plotting here the standard deviation of the line over time. Uh, these two uh, vertical lines on the left is the sort of lower limit of the broadening of the line. It's basically just the thermal broadening of the R21 iron um, assuming uh, initiation equilibrium and uh, the this other rightmost uh, line is the uh, broadening that uh, uh, we take from the example uh, profiles that I showed a few slides ago so I saw sort of um, typical absurd values from iris uh, and uh, this uh, panel uh, shows just the red blue asymmetry over over time um, and uh, this um, uh, error bar, um, so this, I'm talking about panel C, actually I've realized, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but hopefully yes. Um, so uh, it shows the um, error bar that we take from the, op basically the observed values, which are around zero uh, for the profiles I showed at, at the beginning. Um, finally, on the on the right, we have uh, two synthetic profiles uh, that are for the, uh, obtained using this multi-thread loop model that I, um, I just uh, described. Um, so the continuum line is the synthetic line. As you can see, it's very uh, skewed as a, a strong asymmetry in the blue. Um, I'm also overlaying a Gaussian profile to, to show that it's uh, not symmetric. Um, so basically, we, we find lines that are very broad. So the broadening is in agreement with uh, what we observe, but um, the symmetry is not. So it's very asymmetric uh, in contrast to the iris observations. Um, similarly, for uh, the other model B, where we incline the loops, uh, qu uh, so qualitatively we find the same same thing. That the line is at the, the beginning very broad, but still very asymmetric with a blue strong blue asymmetry. Um, however, uh, with the inclination angle, the, both the broadening and the asymmetry are decreasing uh, simply because we are looking through a smaller section of the loop. So that means a smaller velocity gradient, and which will result in smaller broadening and asymmetry at the same time. 
so these are a summary of some of the experiments that we have performed for the Model C, which was the one where we basically assumed that um, that the loops are, are rooted in different locations along the ribbon, um, along the flare ribbons. Um, we're going to go into the details of all the synthetic uh, spectra, but the main uh, point here is that um, uh, that the only profiles where we see small asymmetry, which is what we observe in uh, the iris observations, are also too narrow compared to the observations. Uh, so it, it seems uh, like the, the, the broadened profiles, again, are more asymmetric. And uh, this is also uh, similar to what we found for the last uh, assumption, where we see um, uh, we see the loop bundle with expanding uh, cross section over height with different inclination angles. And again, we, we find again uh, the same trend and the red blue symmetry of the synthetic lines, um, synthetic spectra are at least 20% of the peak. Um, so this is uh, just a summary of this uh, of this um, work. So uh, we tried to basically reproduce the spectral characteristics of the Aris R21 line. Um, using the superposition of flow uh, and um, using a multi-thread model with uh, R um, Radin um, and trying to build different geometries um, uh, as much as you can, of course, with a 1D model. Uh, but uh, we find that uh, there is a consistent uh, anti-correlation between broader and symmetry, so broader profiles are also more asymmetric. And uh, um, most of the models uh, also show that the asymmetry is much uh, bigger, as twice as much, at least as what we observe in the spectra. Uh, so it seems to be hard to reproduce both the broadening and the sym symmetry of these R21 lines from the, the ribbons, uh, just uh, superposing the flows. Uh, so we speculate that there, would, there are, of course, uh, possibly other um, mechanisms that are playing a more important, uh, an important role, such as uh, of course, uh, larger temperatures that we are assuming with radin, which doesn't include non-equivalentation and uh, turbulence, um, different types of turbulence might be required to ex expand the observations. Um, so there is also a recent paper of um, Mandage and uh, Bracho, uh, which uh, was focusing mostly on ice lines, but they could reproduce in some cases uh, broad and symmetric profiles, but only for shorter loops, so, so much shorter than this uh, loops that we observe in this large or typically large flares, but uh, this indicates that, that there could be a, maybe some, uh, it would be uh, useful to expand the parameter space expression and understand uh, why uh, this is the case. Um, so uh, this is uh, more, this, this work has kind of now um, triggered uh, more uh, more work that I've uh, we've been trying to do to expand this uh, this first analysis um, so on two fronts most on one hand we want to uh, sort of expand this uh, as a sort of statistical study to understand if this behavior is actually um, really um, uh, uh, typical of all flares or just maybe the largest flares so the ones that have been observed uh, studied more but if we can actually do a study for all iris flares with different uh, classes as well. And also on the other hand, from the modeling point of view to try to investigate with more uh, sophisticated models or expand the parameter space. Uh, so from the, um, um, the observation point of view, uh, so iris has observed uh, many, um, many flares, around 10 X-class flares, more than 100 M-class flares, and many more uh, see or smaller flares. Uh, so if you're interested, actually, there is a list, uh, there are a list of flares, um, uh, which is uh, updated by the IRIS team that you can find on the IRIS website with different uh, details. Uh, or also you can just search through the data, uh, the database, and there are several of these uh, interesting observations. Uh, so what I've been uh, trying to do recently is to um, expand, as I said, this work. Um, so on one end, for example, this is an example of the same uh, flare we were talking before, uh, but just trying to do a more a systematic uh, study of this uh, asymmetry for all the um, all the pixels over time that are be observed, like these uh, tens of pixels that are observed. And uh, so this is just a fit, um, it's a sit and stir. So uh, these are um, uh, 2D maps of intensity, velocity, uh, broadening, and uh, red blue symmetry as a function of time uh, for this uh, sit and stir observation. And uh, this is the gener general idea, and I'm hoping to apply this to many other flares to increase our statistic. 
Um, and uh, on the other hand, from the observational point of view, uh, we start we. One thing that one might might ask, of course, is uh, if the 1D models, even though we have tried to um, to improve the geometry and simulate different um, possible uh, scenarios for the superposition of flows, of course, the 1D models might might still be missing some of the structuring of the lower atmosphere uh, that are um, are more naturally captured with 3D models. So we have also tried to look into into that. It's still a work in progress, but we have uh, looked at the um, 3D simulations of um, Mark Chang, Matthias Repel et al. using the Muram code. So this is a snapshot of their 3D uh, flare simulation. Uh, the, during the, the basically almost the peak of the flare, um, and uh, so we have uh, synthesized the RN21, uh, the Aris RN21 emission in um, during the flare during the pulsy phase. So this is just a screenshot of the intensity in a 2D XY plane uh, in the simulation, and this is the Doppler shift. Um, and uh, so here you can see the strong uh, blue shifts here are from one of the ribbons. And we have just uh, looked at the integrated RN21 emission over along the, the 3D uh, space along the line of sight. And we obtained this kind of uh, profiles where, uh, as you can see, the line is very broad, but it's also um, simil uh, asymmetric with a blue asymmetry similarly to what we found in the 1D models uh, exploration that we performed. So this is encouraging and uh, saying that prob maybe um, the, what the other results uh, based on 1D models can um, are, are similar to what we found with more sophisticated geometries. Uh, um, and uh, also from the point of view of uh, trying to um, expand the modeling, uh, another um, uh, really uh, interesting approach uh, which has been developed recently is um, uh, uh, Radin, uh, with, uh, it's called Radin Arcade, uh, is basically um, um, first attempt to bridge between the 1D and 3D models uh, was developed by uh, Graham Kerr and Joel Alred uh, very recently. Um, and basically the idea is to use uh, 1D loops from Radin and uh, just um, graph them into uh, active region loops in a 3D domain. Uh, and then project uh, the emission into the 2D observational plane. So here we can see a simulation of a flare arcade uh, using this method, this Radar Arcade method. Um, so here are the simulated Iris CCD images um, of the RN21. Uh, so we can um, you know, kind of obtain, trying to bridge between the flexibility of 1D model, but uh, also looking at a more realistic morphology and dynamics of 3D models. Um, so this uh, we've started also uh, comparing between Iris observations and Radin Arcade. Um, so this is, for example, a superimposed epoch analysis similar to the um, uh, Dave Grimes and Janna's paper. Uh, and we try to compare directly this type of trends with Radin Arcade. Um, it's clear that still the models are systematically underestimating the broadening of the lines. Uh, so we are um, working on that. Uh, this is not surprising also um, since Radin is still not including non equilibrium for ion that uh, we're hoping to um, uh, include soon and um, uh, also explore more more um, hitting uh, parameters. Uh, also, turbulence is not included in this one simplified 1D models yet, so there is a lot to uh, investigate. Um, so that's that's it for me. Um, um, this is my conclusions. Uh, so the, I think the main takeaway from my talk is that um, spectrometers uh, such as Iris provide important diagnostics uh, on flare models. Uh, and I've discussed uh, mostly uh, diagnostics such as uh, uh, flows, Doppler shifts, and line width and profiles. But of course, there are many other diagnostics, um, uh, temperature density, uh, many diagnostics that can be obtained using chromospheric line profiles that I didn't talk too much about. Uh, but um, hopefully, many of these um, uh, uh, diagnostics will also be provided by um, uh, current spectrometers such as PIES and hopefully new uh, UV spectrometers in the future. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Minette. Very nice. Um, Should I anyone has, Sorry. Do you have a question, Jenna? Um, what I was going to say was if anyone has a question, um, if you turn your camera on, it can be an easy way for me to identify. Um, otherwise, feel free to type something in the chat.
I have a question. Sorry. Can you Hi, John. How are you driving? Yeah, in a car. Sorry. Um, very nice talk, Vanessa. I had a, actually two questions related to your um, description of the broadening of the lines, um, of the corner lines in the early phases of the flare. So the first one was that you, in, in the paper from 2019, you were investigating whether uh, flows along um, the the magnetic fields uh, could be contributors to to this width, right? But uh, the early results that you cited from I don't know Doshek of those people about not not there isn't a correlation between the width and the position on the disk. It would seem to me that that by itself should be enough to discard this hypothesis, right? Because right. you know more or less the flare happens along more or less vertical um, vertical field lines or somewhat inclined, but certainly not horizontal. So um, if your hypothesis had merit, maybe you should see some correlation on the way right. the position on the disk. So that was uh, just a, uh, okay. Yeah. Should, okay, uh, should I reply to this first and then you ask? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, just a comment. It was mostly a comment. Okay, okay, go ahead then, yeah. Well, and the other one, I was wondering why you find such as asymmetric profiles in your simulations. So is it correct that you're looking at an optically thin plasma and that you're seeing a lot of uh, velocity gradients in the simulations? Right. Th that is why uh, they are so yeah. asymmetric? Right. So um, so the, the first thing is, uh, yes, I, I agree with you about the Mariska paper. And actually, uh, this is one of the things that uh, this sort of work in progress is supposed to be uh, trying to answer if uh, like we find the same, like is there no correlation with the uh, position on the disk? Uh, because of course that was a very early result and you know the, it was with, done with BCS I think. So of course now we have uh, the iris resolution which is much higher so that would be very interesting and it's something that we're uh, definitely trying to do, uh, just take time. <laughs> and um, then uh, so it is I think um, intuitively due to the fact there is a sort of um, always a bias towards the bl more blue shifted emission because it's first completely blue shifted and then it's going uh, to rest. And uh, also when you incline um, the, the loops, uh, then you will, um, uh, as you say, the problem is the amount of velocity gradients that, that you see. So it's, it's just a sort of result from the geometrical uh, thing if you just superpose the, the flows. Um, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's more intuitively to, um, sketch it and uh, look at the um, it's it's so it's not surprising because it would be kind of hard to perfectly uh, balance the less blue shifted the more blue shifted uh, because so the point is that um, the rest because the line is completely blue shifted and, and uh, the more blue shifted part would also be from the less dense plasma so it's the weight is less um, uh, on the intensity. I don't know if that's kind of uh, answer, I'm just not really uh, answering it like in the more uh, um, uh, proper way, but like intuitively you can see that the the less, the most blue shifted one is also, the uh, plasma is also less dense, less intense, and we'd also, we'd always end up as a more wing rather than uh, contribute equally between the two, the two uh, wings around the peak, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense if it if it stays optically thin throughout, I guess. Yes, uh, Iron Twenty One is definitely optically. Thin. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hi, Paul and Vanessa. This is Lindsay. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't want I don't want to put my camera on because I'm in my bed. <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't, I don't want everybody to see me in my pajamas. So thank you very much, Vanessa, for your talk. That was a lovely talk. And I'm, I'm really happy to see how well the simulation work is proceeding as well as the observations. But I had a question. It just kind of came to my mind as you were showing the results from your recent work with Graham and uh, Joel. Uh, now, one of the things that was really striking about Dave Graham and Jana's uh, um, result was how, how well all of the velocity profiles followed one another as a function of time. 
they were just all on top of one another. But I didn't really see that in the simulation output. Things seem to be a much more much more spread in velocity as a function of time. Is that correct? Do I remember that rightly in the simulations? Yes. So um, I think um, the main the first uh, you know answer is that it's actually really hard to reproduce that smooth, nice behavior. Uh, especially if you're assuming that, you know, uh, each flare loop is heated for like, you know, 10 seconds is short impulsive heating, like what we think from, you know, re uh, sleeping reconnection and all of this evidence, uh, then it's hard to get this coherent behavior. So uh, also the Radin Arcade um, work that we've started to do, it's a very, very first approach. So we have not, I think, uh, one thing that could help to 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 uh, recreate this smooth behavior is to try to um, optimize the way the loops are heated over, uh, you know, activated over time and try to do some um, some really like a lot of work, like more on the lines of what uh, Jeffrey Ripa and Harry Warren have tried to do to try to uh, use a different combination of loop, number of loops uh, in each iris pixel uh, and um, how the, you know, the timing between how this individual strands are activated and all of this. And we haven't still done any of that in for Radin Arcade. It was just a really first approach where we're just yeah. like putting individual 1D lines all in the in the sort of uh, extrapolated field lines from active region. But, but do you think the sun is doing that kind of fine tuning that you're talking about? You know, this is just sort of a, a lot of random, random events, at random locations on the sun and yet everything comes out all lined up. My, yeah. my, my first, my instinct when I saw that um, was, well, you know, could it be that um, uh, everything is evaporating into basically empty flux tubes, you know, so you forget the hydrodynamics of that part, and th it's really easy to make 10 million degree plasma, and as soon as you get 10 million degree plasma, it expands basically adiabatically and always at the same speed, at the appropriate sound speed. That was my in instinct when I, when I saw that, but, you know, Radon simulations yeah. seem to be telling you something different. And probably my yeah. instinct is wrong, but uh, no, I'd like I think somebody that... to explain why and why it's wrong. <laughs> I think you're you're thinking of a model like the, the Jagger's 85 paper like when there is like a sort of adiabatic expansion like isotropically yeah. kind of thing yeah. no i i also have this well idea not necessarily my... isotropic it could just be a free expansion along a tube yeah. along the uh the field but then it does say something about you know the corona must be basically empty compared to the, the part of the chromosphere that you're heating so anyway it's fantastic work i encourage you to keep going <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I agree with you. I think we're very far from it. It sounds like something that it should be easy to, to, to reproduce, but it's actually hard. Like we can reproduce the velocities, right? But you can't reproduce this uh, coherent trend over time. Yeah. And uh, it's. I think there is something important there. Uh, I think probably Jana knows uh, also about that. I think they've tried to 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 seem to model the, the flare that they've looked at with Dave. And it's hard. Uh, I think maybe the solution is that we do have so many very short impulsive events, one after the other, that kind of reproduce a continuous eating for like several minutes. And uh, uh, so I think maybe their solution is in trying to go deep down into how many loops we're observing per pixel and how these are activated. Mm. Maybe I think yeah. that could be an option, but it's still could like be. an open question. OK, thanks. Thanks very much. Nice to see you as well. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs>